Happy Easter, everyone. Happy Easter. Easter continues, right? So in the spirit of Easter, already in this service on the second Sunday of Easter, less than 25 minutes in, we have said or sung the word Alleluia 34 times. 34 times, Alleluia. What are we so happy about? We must be really happy if we're gonna sing and say Alleluia 34 times in a manner of 25 minutes. Well, I wanna tell you what I'm happy about. I am happy about the risen Jesus as he appears in today's gospel. The scriptures, as you know, give us a lot of images of our God, and most of them are filled with lots of drama and majesty. God appears to Moses in the burning bush. God appears to Job in the tempest, the whirlwind. As Jesus is baptized, the heavens are torn open, and the spirit, like a dove, descends upon him. Jesus is transfigured on the mountaintop. His face shines like the sun, and his clothes are as bright as light. At Pentecost, the Spirit lands on the heads as tongues of fire. And then there's this from the Revelation of John. Seven gold lampstands, and in the midst of the lampstands, one like a son of man, wearing an ankle-length robe with a gold sash around his chest and a sharp-edged sword in his mouth, and his face shone like the sun at its brightest. These are all amazing images, but they are not why I am singing Alleluia today. In our gospel today, the Son of God resurrected meets up with his friends, and he is still wounded. Christ takes with him into the resurrection the scars of his betrayal, his unjust trial, his being nailed to the cross, his being pierced with a sword. All through Lent, here in this place, every Sunday, we declare by his blood, he reconciles us. By his wounds, we are healed. But my friends, it was not just a moment of wounding, the moment of death, but the retention of those wounds that heals. Here are the disciples quaking in their sandals in a locked room fearful of losing everything if their neighbors find them, fearful of suffering the same death as their rabbi Jesus or being banished for their loyalty to him. And Jesus returns to them with a word of peace and with a body that shows why he can offer that peace. They need not fear the sword, or the cross, or banishment, or condemnation, because nothing will separate them from the love of God and from the new life that he is pioneering. Nothing. By his wounds, still visible, still touchable, he heals them but not Thomas, because he's not there. So when Thomas does show up a week later, Jesus makes sure that he receives this peace too. He gives Thomas what Thomas needs, which is not a theological argument or a lecture on soteriology. It's not a bag of gold coins or assurance of a seat next to Christ in heaven. He needs Jesus' body, 
risen, but still carrying the kind of brokenness that Thomas and we understand. We know bruises and knocked out teeth, surgical scars and mental illness, bullet wounds and unresolved grief. We know marriages fall apart. We know miscarriages and mastectomies, dashed hopes and dreams abounded. Touch my wounds. For God so loved the world, loved us, that God gave Jesus to be wounded like us and to carry those wounds to the heart of God, not just for a moment in time, but for all time. The resurrected Jesus invites Thomas to touch his wounds, to put his hand into his side. Such an intimate act, so tender and so vulnerable, and so perfect a sign of our ultimate connection with God's life. Between ourselves and God, there is no in-between, as Julian of Norwich said. Between Thomas and Jesus, there is no between, and that is love made manifest for our sake, so that we too might touch the risen Christ, so that we too may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing, we may have life in his name. So what about us? How do we touch the wounds of the risen Christ? Well, remember Jesus' teaching earlier in the gospel? If you've done it to the least of these, you have done it to me. We touch the risen Christ when we see the wounds of Jesus in the world around us, in the wounds of the world. We touch the risen Christ in listening, in feeding, in staying present with, in showing up for, in using our agency on behalf of, in placing our cloak in the road for those who have any share in suffering. We touch the wounded Christ when we touch our own wounds, letting ourselves be vulnerable, asking for help, lamenting. And when we lift up our hands to receive God's peace offered by others, offered here at this altar in the form of blessed bread. It is this wounded savior who invites our touching his wounds, who assures us that, paradoxically, it is there that we will find peace, who invites us to this altar. It is this wounded savior whom we take and bless and break and share in bread and wine. Our tradition uses silver and linens and dresses up the people around the altar, not to avoid the reality of suffering, but to express our unspeakable joy that God is united to us fully in our pain. The little piece of cloth that goes under the bread on the altar is called a corporal a corporal, which means body. It catches the body, the very body that is wounded, that bears our scars to the heart of God. We elevate the bread, not because it's something exotic and outside of our experience, like a meteor from outer space or a magic amulet, but to honor a God who loved us, who are bodies, who loved us bodily. 
we take this blessed bread and wine into ourselves to remind us of this bodily God, of God's power and desire to love our wounded bodies. And in a way that we cannot understand, but we know to be true, to become part of us. Edith Sitwell wrote, Christ bears in his heart all wounds. As we who are baptized into Christ's risen, scarred body gather at this table to take his body and blood into ourselves, let us be what we see and receive who we are. Alleluia. <laughs>